Welcome back, everyone, to the Classic Movie Matinee, where I'll introduce a new guest each week to a classic they have never seen and ask the question, is it truly a classic and did they enjoy the movie? Today, we're going to talk about the movie that every film scholar thinks is one of the greatest movies ever made, Orson Welles' directorial debut, Citizen Kane. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? This is Orson Welles. I'm speaking for the Mercury Theater, and what follows is supposed to advertise our first motion picture. Citizen Kane is the title, and we hope it can correctly be called a coming attraction. Joining me today, the co-host of Friday's Game Night, Movie Date Night, Moral Combat, Flops at Times, Greg. I miss you. It's great to see you having you on here. I, I, I can't thank you enough for being on this episode. Any reason to spend time with you, Johnny. I always enjoy our fun talks, um, especially on your other one that you had me on when we were talking about the Olympics. Oh, Last yeah. time they were out, those were fun too. So I jumped to this chance. Yeah. By the way, great intro theme. I loved that. That big bandy kind of feel. I was tapping. I was snapping. I was dancing along with that. That was fun. I I thought to myself, like, if I'm going to do classic movies and I want to introduce it to a, a new movie to somebody that's never watched it before, it kind of this is the error for it. This is the I jazz agree. band. I really agree. Greg, you have a movie podcast with your wife. Mm-hmm. You know, you guys enjoy watching movies. What what movies um, do you, do you particularly like watching classic movies? Are you more of like time and day of where you're at from where you're born? Do you like revisiting old movies? Uh, tell me what your relationship is when it comes to classics. And I think that this might be part of the generation that I am where, you know, I'm kind of like on that early, early millennial kind of cusp, you know, or like Z- Z- Zillennial, whatever they call it. You know, I was born in 86. And the thing about that time is that we were just starting to get like a lot of like multimedia programming. The internet wasn't quite out yet when I was a little kid. And so it was all about just watching reruns of movies mm-hmm. on TV because the channels are trying to figure out like, okay, we now have thousands of channels, but we have no content. So just grab a bunch of old movies and put those on there. Or like you'd have like your shoe rack full of VHSs and you just watch those over and over again. So for sure, like I definitely have those kind of baselines that built the personality that I have Mm -hmm. for, you know, the movies I like. For example, one that I always turn to that I think is a big puzzle piece for laying the foundation for me that I had as a VHS as a kid was Mac and Me, which is notoriously a bad film, but I love it. And I think that's the... That's the seedling that sprouted my love for like cheesy, can't be bad films. But along with those films were lots of classics, you know, like I did have some of the old ones with um, with, you know, Humphrey Bogart in them, you know, like the African Queen or Casablanca, things like that. You know, of course, we had. um, Oh, gosh, why am I blanking on the name right now? I only just started drinking the one where it's about the Civil War and it's frankly my gear. Oh, Gone with the Wind. You know, of course, we had that one. We had that one like two or three VHSs, if I remember correctly, because you can't fit yeah, it yeah. all into one cassette. But yeah, so it was kind of like I was watching my Land Before Times, but then I was also watching, you know, like Star Trek One, the original, you yeah. know, with um, William Shatner with my dad. So I kind of had like a nice eclectic mix. And then from there, I kind of like, found the ones I want to dive deeper on. But I never shied away from the old black and white classic films because usually those, especially in my house, were more like detective ones, like the noir ones, like Maltese Falcon. Mm -hmm. So, and then of course, when I discovered the true, the true like perfect Venn diagram, that was Who Framed Roger Rabbit, where, Mm -hmm. oh, it's a noir, but it's also cartoons. And hey, it's a little sexy too. I was like, this is my spot right here. You you bring up a good point, especially with Who Framed Roger Rabbit. I, you know, I have a greater appreciation for that movie simply because of the movies I watched beforehand about it. Like, it it doesn't, Mm -hmm. like, when it comes to noir, like, you know, Maltese Falcon, Double Indemnity, which I think is probably the best noir film you'll watch. I haven't seen that forever. Thank you for reminding me of that one. It's back on my list now. So those movies, for me, kind of help shape. And that's why I want to do, like, these special episodes of, classic movies because i think in this generation i'm like to appreciate what we have now you kind of have to watch a little bit back because then you kind of get the references or the homages and stuff like that 
Like, for example, sorry, to, yeah, I just want to play off that. One that Lauren, my wife, actually introduced me to was It Happened One Night. Oh. Where it had happened one night. The, it's a good movie, by the way. For those who haven't seen it, I won't spoil it too much. It's Go watch it. It's kind of like a weird road trip movie, if you think about it. But the thing that's great about that is that that is the genesis of the I'm going to, as a woman, lift my leg to hitchhike. And mm-hmm. a car is going to come to a screeching halt to let me in. Yeah. That's where that started from. So like even like Bugs Bunny spoofs that. So like, yeah, it's kind of fun to go back to classic movies and be like, that's where that started from. Uh, listeners at home, I will tell you this. Um, I think I might have found my second episode with Greg if he wants to come back because that is a movie I have not watched. Oh, I have heard of that movie, but it's I've never so good. It. You so, know what? Actually, I, I might have Lauren tag in for me on that one because oh, she loves that film. Movie. And, and that's part of the fun with this, uh, guys, because I will find guest hosts to come with me to show me movies that I haven't seen. Because as much as I like watching classic movies, I have a whole big catalog that I have not watched. And that's one that's on my list. That's the problem. There's too much nowadays. So you really got to like pick and choose your fights. Correct. you know. And kind of leading into what we're going to be talking about. One of the reasons I never watched this movie is that we're going to talk about today is just because I felt like I had the gist of it from just the pop cultural zeitgeist knowledge. So that's a good segue because our first episode, which I had, uh steve uh from steven's corner talk about was singing the rain and one of the reasons why he never watched that movie to begin with was just like you said he sees all the pop culture stuff so he has an idea of what the movie is so he did it isn't something that he wanted to come visit yeah and you're saying that this kind of the same way with citizen kane yeah because i mean spoiler alert by the way for the rest of this hour that we're going to be talking so like yes I, let me just get this out of the gate. All the hype is true. This is a fantastic film. You should watch this film. If you are listening and you have not watched this film, I promise you, do yourself the favor. Go watch it first blind as much as you can and then come back. It's kind of like I remember in school, the first time I was asked to read The Curious Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, mm-hmm. right? Even before I got anywhere near that book in my hands, I knew the twist that Dr. Jekyll is Mr. Hyde. Spoiler alert for a book that's 200 years old. (laughs) Sorry. But like, the thing is, it is such a good damn book. And it sucks (laughs) that the the spoiler is blown for you by the time you're four. And same thing with this movie. If I didn't know who, what, or where Rosebud came from, Yeah, that would have been a hell of a journey. But the entire time, I'm like, it's a sled. It's a sled. Go <laughs> check the attic. It's a sled. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and I agree. And I think part of that is, I, I talked about this a little bit when we had overrated uh, movies during the 80s. I nominated mm-hmm. Spaceballs. Look, you guys, I'm being very facetious. I think Spaceballs is a good movie. I just don't think it's... Great, like everyone says. That being Fair. said, I knew I didn't get the jokes in Spaceballs until I actually saw Star Wars. Mm-hmm. This applies to The Simpsons because up until college, when they I actually finally saw this movie in a class, all the references I got from The Simpsons, I I assumed it was Citizen Kane, but I never watched the movie. So then when I watched the movie and then I rewatched The Simpsons, it made the joke funnier. There's the Kane from Citizen Kane. Wait a minute! There was no Kane in Citizen Kane. Like I get it now, mm-hmm. especially with the episode where he does, which is titled Rosebud, and Mr. Burns is trying to find Bobo. Bobo is kind of a youth, or kind of like a synonym or metaphor for, you know, uh, mm-hmm. Rosebud and stuff like that. And so I, I think that was pretty cool to see. I will tell you this: I think it's one of the greatest spoiler, one of the greatest movies that you'll ever see. Uh, Damn right. So. If you guys pause this episode now, watch it, come back. That'd be cool. But it's only two hours, by the way. It's not a super long film. And and the thing about for me is that it took me probably until maybe like five, six years ago to really recognize that because I recognized the technical achievements. I just couldn't get into the story. I think the first time was because I watched it for class. And when you watch anything for school, you treat it like homework. So you don't mm-hmm. really 
watch it as a you, you don't get to see it. You're just academically looking at it. I, I gave it a few more shots, and I just remember several years ago I watched it, and it just finally clicked. I'm like, okay. And then rewatching it for today, I was like, shit, this movie is great. Like for for what Orson Welles, a first time director, who had a deal of the century. This guy had creative control over this whole movie, how the movie's cut, how the movie's shot, how the movie is produced, the actors, stuff like that. He had total control, which is very unheard of. And it's his first movie making, first time making a movie. This guy just put on such a classic. So that being said, we'll, we'll jump right into the movie and thinking about kind of like the shots that he did. And I'm just thinking about the, the camera work, just, you know, you start from like kind of the gate and you keep moving on and you see the house house, which every time I see the house, I think of Mr. Burns house because that is where it got lifted from, you know, and right, I, right, right. I see the K and I'm all like, look, I, I know this as a B because this is what I see. <laughs> yeah. But it, it's, it's such a good ominous start to like the movie because then, you know, the guy Kane drops it, whispers R- Rosebud and you're just like, oh, we're going to start with this movie. And it just cuts right into the newsreel, which I thought was really smart. News on the mark. I thought that was a crazy way. I well, I was because Lauren had never seen this either. My wife mm-hmm. and we're watching it like last night, and I turned to her. I said, "What if this?" Because remember, I have no idea about this movie other than Rosebud, and then yep. it's sled to the end. That's literally all I know. I know the bookends. I don't know about anything in the middle. I've seen pictures of him. Like he's clearly running for some kind of political thing. Maybe that's why he's called. But like, I literally know nothing about Citizen King. But like, I'm watching this with her. And I'm like, what if the entire movie is this newsreel? I'm here for that too. Mm-hmm. Like, that's pretty fantastic. The idea of an entire movie just being a newsreel. Fuck yeah. But um, no, I thought what was really interesting about the beginning was how many layers they show just fading in it's like the signs the gate another fence you know all this it's like you're already building so masterfully the fact that this guy has so many layers to him Mm -hmm. and that he was so um kind of like cordoned off like quarantined off himself even from the rest of the world he like hid himself away near the end of his life and i was like damn like even right out the gate like you don't even say two words to me yet and already i get this guy right and it's crazy because as the pro- story progress, you, like you said, you see the layers kind of like the armor that he has around him mm-hmm. when you get to him. But then you watch the whole movie and you see that armor being built and you understand why he keeps building, building yep. defenses around him, which I thought was really great to see. The newsreel, uh, you know, RKO, he did a lot of radio shows. So I, I knew just with the voice and the actors they had that, that that's just a... Uh, Great way of calling his land Sanadu, the Mar-a-Lago of this day and age, apparently, kind of. <laughs> you know. See, the problem is I kept hearing Xanadu and I kept seeing the roller skating movie in my yep. head. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I know it's from that quote, which just happens to be in both films about Kublai Khan and the Pleasure Palace, but I'm like, Xanadu. <laughs> right. You know, and, and you know what I what what he does well, and I think he's a not, I don't know if he's technically the first one, but he's the one that mastered a lot, is that shows a scene, and then you just realize it's pulled off from something else. Like, it transitions pretty seamlessly. Mm-hmm. So, you watch this new cast, and you're thinking to yourself, oh, this is, it's going to cut, and then we'll get to another scene. But no, it, it kind of blends into, oh, these are guys that are in the newspaper seeing this for the first time, seeing what their edit is. And I thought it was very seamless in transition, and you get a lot of that going into it. I thought it's very smart at least for me, like more times I think about it is use the newsreel to tell about his life. But then now you're going to tell the story and you get different vantage points from citizen Charles Foster Kane. He is never the same person in every retelling of whoever's telling the story during that time and age. Exactly. And I thought that was beautiful. Uh, you know, it's very smart writing uh, something that, you know, back then, I think when you think about movies, before his it's just very straightforward it's like you have mm-hmm. a beginning middle and end. you don't mess around with the timelines and he does that really well and he makes it so it doesn't seem very confusing like he he it, it's something new yet it's something you can follow in fact even so that 
at one point or at a couple points even they show the same scene with the different characters retelling like at one point you'll forgive me i forget the characters names but one was like his his like partner in the newspaper was telling the story and then he goes to his second wife the blonde singer and they show the same point of her on stage about to sing the opera almost as if like it's a baton handing off like here's where the story connects back up you know and also you're right what's interesting about the film is that you know charles kane is a little bit different portrayed in each segment because it is not really the accurate like unbiased view of charles kane it is this person's interpretation and telling of who charles kane was and you can also kind of see how as the well let's just call him the interviewer for sake of argument you know because it is a newspaper guy or a magazine or whatever the newsreel guy rather who's like trying to do the investigation for who rosebud is but he's kind of like an interviewer as he's going through these different people they all had like increasingly more negative opinions about charles kane at the end of their relationship with him you know it might have started out sweet but like eventually it starts off with like oh a business partner who it just didn't work out oh a best friend who he fires and betrays oh a guy who he kind of like you know ignored and treated like crap and said like well i'm gonna do what i'm gonna do oh an ex-wife you know it gets progressively worse and worse so he gets progressively more and more aggressive Mm -hmm. in his tellings but also he's getting older and he's having more stuff dumped on him so it's kind of like an interesting layers of how the character progresses and why the character progresses that way you know i you once we start that yeah you know the interviewer starts interviewing people i think he starts with the second wife and then you kind of see his backstory they found gold on their family's land the um uh who's the banker's name thatcher Mm -hmm. and you know she wants to make sure that he is provided with education, guardianship. And so, you know, they make a deal. I don't understand this deal. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I had to back it up and rewind it three times. Like, I must admit something critical. Why are they giving up their child to this banker? You know? So basically what it is is that, like, you know, they discovered gold. Yeah, yeah. And it belongs to the mother. Mother knows that, like, you know, she, she wants to be able to give the education that it is. And, and they kind of show the father being like implying that he's very abusive, doesn't care. And so, he Oh, knows. maybe that's what it was. Okay. So, so I'm like, uh, yeah, the and banker's I think, like saying to the mom, we'll give you a stipend of $50,000 every year for the rest of your life. So I'm like, so then why does the mom need to give up Charles again? <laughs> because they have money. She yeah. can buy him an education with that. But I think you're right. I think it's the idea that she's like, I just got to get him away from this, from her, his father. That's a mess right there. And that's the little kind of wrinkle you have, right? Like one of the things that struck out at the end was that when uh, his mom tells him what's going to happen, introduces him to Thatcher, what does uh, Charles do? Takes a sled, tries to run away. (laughs) And so, you know, the... The, the metaphor of escaping, retaining that childhood, something that he tries to gain. You fast forward later, he gets to an age where he gets control of his trust. What does he want to do? Own a newspaper. You know, one of the things that I learned early in my movie uh, literary class was that he is also, Charles Kane is also a step in for William Randall Randolph Hearst. Mm-hmm. Oh, which, for sure. I'm not that big into history, but I had to look him up during the time when I was in college. And I was like, oh, this makes sense. No wonder if you're wondering why Citizen Kane was on a box office hit. It's because this guy, uh, you know, was also controlling a newspaper, trying to get people to boycott the movie. Yeah. Did you hear that he didn't he refused to run anything about this movie in his papers at the time? Yep. He's like, we're not even going to mention it. Yeah, mention it. So, you know, it, number and, one it, movie at the time, not going to mention it. And, and it's crazy the the juxtaposition of that's happening. And then you think about the movie and the stuff that, you know, Charles is going to do in this movie. It's just like very on the nose, mm-hmm. which, you know, William Hurst should have noticed this stuff, but he didn't. Right. What do you think of the scenes going like I one of the biggest things I remember is that, and, and this was a really crazy like transition scene. Like I said, he does a lot of transitions really well. Was that? Oh, especially had, anytime anyone walks through a doorway. Yeah. The, it's, and it's a long shot of them walking. Like you can watch them walking away like half a mile. Those are great. Those let me stun. Yeah. I, I, I love the transition where him, and then I think it's um, Jedediah and that's his name. The, yeah. the other guy 
I forgot what the other guy's name is. The the other Neil, guy that he's like he, uh, that's with him most of the time. They were looking yeah, yeah. at the chronicle and they're like, "Oh, look at these people. We're gonna hire them." Like yeah. at some point, right? And you see the still picture, and then you're looking at the still picture, and I th- and then next thing you know, it's like, "Oh shit!" They're actually taking it's the, the exact picture, same still the same picture, same, and they pull out, pull out and it's right. these eight men sitting there going, "Like, yep, we just hired them." Like, yeah. that was a crazy transition. I loved that. You know how long it took the Chronicle to get that staff together? 20 years. 20 years. Well, six years ago, I looked at a picture of the world's greatest newspaper men. I felt like a kid in front of a candy store. Well, tonight, six years later, I got my candy. All of it. (laughs) Welcome, gentlemen, to the Inquirer. And, and, And to me, it's like those little things. Some people, like with modern movie like technology some people can't pull that stuff off that he's doing for real in splicing cutting during that time right. and you know that and that, he did this 100 years ago boys and girls yeah <laughs> oh, pr- pretty much we're, we're getting close <laughs> we're getting there um you know and, and i i just i i thought those are things what are you know as we go through you know his life we we have him taking over the newspaper you know he gets introduced and marries the president's niece Gets political aspirations, but gets blackmailed because of a person, a singer, quote unquote, as they put in the newspaper. How dare uh, you put those in quotes? <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that he loves. And then you kind of see kind of the set. Are, what are some big things that you take away from the, the movie? Any, any other particular scenes or uh, characters that you really enjoyed in this movie? I mean, of course, Kane himself stands out, you know? Yeah. And I... I'll save my reviews for him later. I feel like we need to dedicate a section at the end for just like talking about him in general. But for the other characters, I, I even though she's not in it as much, I really loved his first wife. Yes. You know, I think watching the little montage of their marriage slowly like disintegrating as it's like time lapse, time lapse, time lapse of like them at dinner, him, him like kind of fawning over her, them at dinner, he's too busy with work. Them at dinner, they're like barely talking to each other. Them at yeah. dinner, she's like giving him snide remarks and he's not even noticing, you know. Do you know how long you kept me waiting last night while you went to the newspaper for 10 minutes? What do you do in a newspaper in the middle of the night? Emily, my dear, your only correspondent is the Inquirer. Sometimes I think I'd prefer a rival of flesh and blood. Oh, Emily, I don't spend that much time on the newspaper. It isn't just the time. It's what you print, attacking the president. You mean Uncle John? I mean the president of the United States. He's still Uncle John. Like, I definitely liked that part there. Even though he's very short-lived in the film, um, his political rival, Getty or Gates or whatever his name was. Oh, yeah. Gettys. Gettys, that's it. He... (laughs) commands that scene like the only way he's washed out is because orson wells is there as citizen king yeah i i i i was really amazed at the scene when he gets him in the room and it's all like we're gonna run the story he's all like no i'm not gonna do it and then he's like okay we're gonna teach you know this would be a lesson someone would learn but you're gonna need more than one lesson if anybody else would say what's gonna happen to you would be a lesson to you only you're gonna need more than one lesson you're gonna get more than one lesson don't worry about me gettys don't worry about me. I'm Charles Foster Kane. That that line chilled me. You're gonna need more than one lesson, aren't you? You know. <laughs> and, and and then you know he's walking through the staircase. And it's just like the command. It, it, it's 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 great to see. And you know this was the first movie I read that like he. Most people, when you look at the camera, it's kind of straightforward. You know, up and down, people in the center. He's the first one to try to do the angle where you can see the roof, and that kind of builds a lot of intimacy mm-hmm. it, into it and i and it, it i we take it for granted now but thinking about that in the 40s where no one has been doing it and he's the first one to kind of do it and it's like oh shit like it, it just gives a different uh take on how to produce a movie which which this movie does in spades you know the other thing that really struck me and it's not really maybe this is another section but that's not really character, but it's the play and expert use of shadows. Yes. How in any scene, almost, like it is just so perfectly done. And the one that really sticks out to me, well, there's two. One is, we're already on that talk, talking about it, the scene where Gettys is confronting him in the 
um, quote unquote singer's apartment, the love mm-hmm. nest, if you will, you know, on how Gettys is in the shadow and Kane is there. And then at one point, the dynamic in the conversation switches and Kane goes into shadow and Gettys is now in the light. And the other one that really, really sticks out of my mind is when the newsreel ends and yeah. the men are talking about it. And yet to mind, remember, the newsreel is the obituary, essentially, of Charles Foster Kane. He has died at that point, And they are essentially trying to sum up his life. And what's great about that newsreel is it is a roadmap for the rest of the movie. Mm-hmm. It is telling you, essentially, guys, here's the table of contents for the next hour and a half that you're about to go through. And... What's fantastic about it is it is in a darkly lit room with just the projector going. And it's, you know, them kind of then talking afterwards. And the only thing that stands in my mind as an equally kind of fun way to play with light in the movie is in the original Jurassic Park, where they are sitting around the table and they are having a little dinner before everything goes bad. And John Hammond's pitching it. And they have the little slideshows going. And there's like five different projectors in different directions going around the dinner table. And they're just like having talks, just like, and then you can see over here, we have this attraction over here. We have that down. You know, it was such an interesting way to play with the light in the room and have it bounce as we, you know, silhouettes off the back of people's heads or illuminating their faces in certain ways. I really, really enjoyed it. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that they started doing movies and pictures a couple years beforehand. So he could have done this in in color, but he didn't use the black I, and Yeah, white. I was thinking about that too, because I was wondering, would the shadows have played as well if it was in color? I don't think so. I think you kind of need this to be black and white. Yeah, this movie needed, because the movie is uh, about the gray, right? It's not just black and white. He mm-hmm. plays with the gray spots. Exactly. Because so at the end of the day, we don't really know who Charles Foster Kane really is. We have glimpses and different pieces together and we have an idea, but we truly don't know. And so exactly. And that that's kind of the other point I was going to make is, yeah, that obituary at the beginning of the newsreel, it to, it tries to say, oh, this was Charles Foster. He was a, you know, a, a, a newspaper magnate. He was a, you know, uh, a foreign um, kind of diplomat almost because he went over and went to the European unions and talked to some of the leaders. You know, he was a uh, political um, aspirationalist, you know, and he built uh, architecture. He was an art collector, all these things. And they're like, yeah, and here's the list of things he did. But then when you actually dive into those different chapters, you're like, it was way more than just that. Or like his reasons for doing some of those things were suspect at best. And like, we need to dive deeper into the psychology of like, why did he choose to do this? Let me ask, do you, do you think this movie, I know this movie is great. I think you know this movie is great. I think everyone listening knows this movie is great. It's great. <laughs> I'm just trying to think to myself, if I was trying to show this to 15, 16 year old high schooler right now, do you mm-hmm. think they would appreciate the stuff that's happening in this movie? that's okay. I've had this conversation before with many other people and that's a tricky one because I think that with the amount of immediacy Mm -hmm. that media presents itself with these days, I think that typically a movie from that's quote unquote, a classic, those had a kind of a slower burn buildup, right? Even something that you, I think you could still qualify as a classic by some definitions, but it's more modern like alien. Mm-hmm. That is a slower buildup, but it's a great film. But it takes a while for the actual thing to start happening, for them to actually discover the first egg and for that thing to you know happen, which I won't spoil in case anyone hasn't seen it and wants to see that movie. But I feel that with Citizen Kane, because so much gear changing happens in the first 10 minutes, like we said, it's the slow transition into the different layers and then it's the deathbed and then it's also on a newsreel and then it's not a newsreel. I think that's enough to get people to go like, Oh wait, what's happening? You know, this is definitely a movie that I feel is done a major disservice. If you try to second screen this, mm-hmm. if you are happen to be, if your phone's in your hand while you're watching this film, shame on you. <laughs> you are, you are hurting yourself. Like I norm, listen, I try not to do that myself, but I'm guilty of it sometimes, especially if it's a movie that like is more modern that I'm like, okay, like yeah. Transformers 
it's going to be just a bunch of nonsense garbage CGI happening on the screen. I get it. Robots punching robots. Fine. Yeah. But like something like this, where as we talked about, even like the visual construction of the scene gives you information. It's almost like having a jigsaw puzzle with a piece missing. Wink for those who have watched this film. <laughs> oh, man. That was that, that was a really crazy transition in there. And like I said, I think sometimes it's hard to have people kind of place themselves in the time and age where things are being made. Because mm-hmm. if, you know, and I have a hard time sometimes, but but I, I can just see the technical prowess in this movie. And it's great. And it, and the thing is, is that the script of this movie is things that people do to this day where it's like, okay, we're going to take different points of view to tell a story, right? I, I think during this time, Kurosawa was doing Rashomon. He didn't see this movie yet, so it's not kind of like the same. But but the, the idea is there. Like, oh, let's yeah. tell different points of view about uh Oh, that, that's a good point, too. Yeah, like you're that. right. It's... um. It's just like Rashomon or uh, what's the more modern one? A hero with Jet Li. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Where, yeah, it's you have essentially s- multiple people telling the same story, but with their own personal bias Correct. or perspective or slant on it. In fact, if any of you listening do want to watch a more modern version of that, that I think would capture a more modern sensibility, definitely go watch Hero. Because yes. that especially, depending upon who's telling that same story, and it's like, just the same one chapter being told like four different times. Yep. But what's great about it is not only does it, does it slightly differ in the details, but the color palette changes with each telling. At first it's red and then it's yellow, then it's green and then it's white to show like what truly happens. And that's amazing. But yeah, I agree with you. Um, there's definitely like this key moment in Hollywood history right here in the early forties where like, all these revelations are starting to happen. All these like new techniques and new methods of like how to not only produce, but how to direct and how to, you know, block certain scenes that really, yeah, it's kind of the point of your podcast. If like, here's where that comes from. You know, I think the only thing like, like a modern day one that you could point out is like, Oh, Michael Bay is the one who started lens flares. Got it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess, you know, we, we, we kind of sum up the movie, some of the things that we like. Are there things that you saw that wouldn't hold up today where some, you know, 10-year-old kid be like, that would be bullshit, whether it's the script or just the filmmaking or anything of that nature that you noticed? The only thing I can think of that comes to mind for that is, like I said, even I as a 36-year-old man was confused about, wait, why is the mom giving up her kid again? <laughs> yeah. You know, this banker just said, we've got money coming your way. Why? You know, so I honestly at the moment attributed to like, ah, it's a it's a 19th century problem. It's it's their reasoning. I don't know why it's fine. Um, You know, that that whole like the whole childhood chapter, I feel goes a little too fast. Mm -hmm. I feel like we needed to slow down and like really hammer home like because that is the foundation that the entire movie and understanding Kane's personality is based upon the fact that he was essentially sold to the bank. Yeah. That's, and that's a crazy statement. A kid was sold to the (laughs) bank and it's like, he's outside sledding. He's like eight years old. He's having a good time. And his mom says, come on in your bags packed. This banker man's going to take you away. He goes, would you like to go see Chicago, New York son? He goes, no, I'd rather keep here and sledding. (laughs) Yeah. His childhood was totally robbed. And so that brings us back to the man himself, Citizen Kane himself, Charles Foster Kane. At the end of this movie, how did you feel about the character? He goes through a lot of ups and downs in this film. And I mean, at the beginning, with the newsreel, you're like, oh, this is clearly a great and powerful man. He's very charismatic and the little bit of newsreels they have of him. Like when he's getting interviewed coming off the boat from Europe and he's giving the snappy one-liner comebacks. And even tell him the interviewer how to do his job. He goes, hey, you know, I used to run a newspaper. You know, you're supposed to ask questions faster than this kid, you know. Yeah. You know, he he's he's charming. And, like, I can see why, you know. And, of course, my personal radar, when they say, like, oh, he was married twice, divorced twice. I'm like, oh, okay, there's something going on there. But, you know, that's just, like, 
the little tiny like you know foreshadowing clue that there's he's not 100 percent on board for you know or 100 um, percent kosher i should say in terms of like being a real um good guy but i really liked seeing him rise to the occasion mm-hmm. and then seeing his just under the surface yet increasingly boiling fury that he would get when something did not go his way, when he came across an obstacle that he couldn't charm or buy his way out of. Like the level of subdued rage he has when he's talking to Gettys in that apartment, you know, like you can tell he just wants to fire out and like clobber the guy. And he would absolutely destroy him in a fight if he came to that. But he knows he can't and he knows he shouldn't. And as Gettys is walking out the apartment building, Kane goes after him and like leans over the balcony railing and is just shouting at the top of his lungs all his rage out into the void. Doesn't care if Gettys hears him or not. He just needs to get this out. Yeah. And after having kind of a day to think about it, I think I can sum up Kane in one descriptive word. He's the contrarian. Yeah. I think that if you look at him from the moment from when he's a young man buying his first newspaper up until his death, essentially, he is the kind of person who's, who someone tells him that's not a good idea or you can't do that. And he says, I'll show you, you know, it's that opposite attitude. And, you know, I, I think for me, when we think about Charles Foster, I would be remiss after seeing the newsreel and then seeing the reporters, the people in the newsroom kind of go after it. They try to paint him in a very good light, but mm-hmm. he seemed like an asshole. But I think that's yeah. that. But but that is the best part, because then when you you start trying to get to know him, you kind of see why he became to be. And that asshole just became more of a tragic figure, which he had so many things to do good. I think one of the best scenes I liked was where when they first first forming the Inquirer, he writes his commitments, if you will. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And what was it like the declaration of morality yeah, were, or something like yes, that? Right. And Jedediah is like, I want to keep this after they print it. And, and then, he sends it at his back to his ass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He sent it back. But here was the great thing about it is that he saw it. And then as he was talking to the second wife, he just starts ripping it up as if it was nothing. Like it, yeah. it, it, it just that it blew just, my mind. It that just, absolutely you know, blew my mind. Something like, that sentimental just kind of this, disappeared. It's almost like he saw this symbol of his pure intentions mm-hmm. and his youthful vigor, you know, cause at this point he's like, at least I think you can agree with me 20 years later, yeah. if not further down the pike. And he rips it up as if he's trying to destroy a weakness yeah. that he feels now. He feels like, I was such a fool for feeling this way or like, this is such a silly little thing. I'm going to rip this up. This means nothing to me now, you know? And also it, I kind of feel like he's trying to show like, I can't be sentimental about anything. I have to just focus on what is important to me and accomplishing my goals at this moment. I mean, going back to the, really the Gettys thing is really where it turns for me. I'm sorry, but yeah. like Gettys going, let me explain that situation to those who haven't watched and shame on you for listening to this lot and not watching. We gave you multiple warnings. Yeah. Um, he is running for political office. I believe they said it's governor and Gettys is his number one opponent. And recent pollings have shown that Kane's going to just walk away with this election essentially, mm-hmm. yep. you know, and the problem is that Kane's married to, you'll forgive me for not knowing the names of the wives because they're kind of in and out of the film so infrequently. So I'm just going to say wife number one. He's married to wife number one and he is seeing what is going to be wife number two on the side. Mm-hmm. And Gettys finds out and he kind of sends a letter to wife number one and to the um, wife, future wife number two to be like, let's all meet at the apartment and talk this out, you know? And he kind of blackmails Kane and he's like, you are going to pull out of this race or I'm going to print in all the newspapers that I have influence with about what's exactly happening here. Yeah. And how is that going to look to your son, your eight year old son? Mm -hmm. And Kane essentially is like, not going to tell me what to do. (laughs) You can do whatever you want, but I'm going to, I'm going to stay in this race. And of course it still ruins him because, you know, 
polit- popular opinion was a big deal, especially in politics back then. So he loses the election. But it's just, it's amazing. It's amazing. That's all I could say. Just, it's amazing. Like yeah. that one seat and how that one moment really turns his life. Because I think if you think about the rest of his life up to that point, that's his first loss. Yeah. Before that, you know, Citizen Kane, or sorry, not Citizen, uh, Charles Kane was Charlie Sheen hashtag winning the mm-hmm. entire way through. And that's the first brick wall he couldn't spa- he couldn't just bash through. And then and from I, there, he really starts to spiral. And I think that's smart because winning and losing because he was winning and everything, right? He, he owned the newspapers. He bought people out. He found, like I said, his first wife was the president's niece. Mm-hmm. Has oh, that's right. I forgot about that. Yeah. And then, you know, he has this uh, affair that's on the side. And then that's his first loss. What happens after that? He. Well, first of all, has, did, didn't they mention the news are real that his wife and child died in a car crash like a week later yeah, or something like later, that? Yeah, later. So, yeah. Like it's, crazy. And, you know, after that, he gets a divorce, right? He marries the new op- opera singer, quote unquote, that he says. Uh, but then she can't sing in any opera house so he builds an opera house okay for her. i'm sorry i'm not a musical person i didn't think her singing was that bad yeah I, I i wouldn't be able to tell i would need someone that you know that can that likes opera to tell you me need that someone with better. a mustache to be like some people have seen some people don't yeah you don't <laughs> and and one of these is one of the great scenes right because it's something that people meme and stuff is like you know they're they're giving her flowers but people are barely clapping and then he's just in the back shadow looking intently just clapping right. clapping okay. clapping cuz that actually that unlocks something for me that scene mm-hmm. and it involves Shia LaBeouf mm. do you remember the music video about Shia LaBeouf yes I yeah do. i think he's mimicking that that Right and, when and, he's alone in the auditorium clapping yeah. at his own song, I was like, "Is that Citizen Kane? Kane. Is yes. that? Sh- oh my god!" So it's important to watch these classic films, guys, because all of a sudden, all these like inside jokes will unlock for you. Uh, anything else that 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 you see, like people should take notice in this movie. I think um, the other thing that's really powerful to me is so after. After Charles Kane goes and forces his second wife to go on an opera tour where she knows she sucks. She wants to stop. And he goes, nope, I said you're a singer. You're going to be a singer, goddammit. You know, and like she even I think at one point tries to commit suicide because she's that depressed about it. He then goes and builds her Xanadu, which is this great like multi-million dollar like today it would probably be worth like billions and billions of dollars to construct that thing quote unquote pleasure palace but honestly it's like a it's a hodgepodge of all the different architectural designs like i watched that in the beginning i'm like oh there's egyptian there's like norwegian there's like greek in here like what are we doing here but of course he's also collecting art across the world so i guess he needs a place to put it all but it's a massive room and this is one room in particular that really stands out in my mind where he has such a huge fireplace that a man could walk into it without stooping down and not bump his head. Like that's how big this fireplace is. You know, if you want a more modern day reference, go watch the house on Haunted Hill with Liam Neeson and Catherine Zeta Jones. They had a huge fireplace in there and it's like that big, you know? So he's standing in front of that and his wife, wife number two is sat on like the floor or like some stairs or something nearby doing a jigsaw puzzle. Like, but she's like 60 feet away. She's like a good distance away. And he is having a conversation, shouting, shouting at her in this super echoey room about, I thought we'd have a picnic tomorrow. And it's like, you can't come over here and talk to your wife. You're going to insist on sitting in that chair that's so far away and then tell her we're going to go on a picnic tomorrow. Like, you know, I think that was just so powerful to show like how empty this relationship is how absolutely desolate she feels because she's even saying to him in that scene, like I'm lonely. He goes, well, you just had a party yesterday. Yeah. But look at this big freaking house. There's nothing here. There's nobody here. Right. You know? And like, at least in something like Downton Abbey, another modern day reference, like even in those big rooms, in the big house, you see a servant in the background every now and then, but this scene is absolutely abandoned except for these two people. And even with a huge fireplace and a fire going in it, the room feels dark. It feels cold. It feels lonely. 
And that was just stood out to me as like, man, if I could like frame this scene, like and just put that on the wall, like, yeah. you know, cause some, not all art has to be happy. Sometimes you want something that's a little bit kind of like morose or melancholy. I'm like, that's, that's it for me, man. Yeah. Oh, I hear that's, it's great to point that out. I can't be remiss. I, I tell everyone uh, with this, we, we talk about, we call it the Roger Ebert corner to talk about what he wrote about the movie. And this guy's, a big, this. This guy's a big champion uh, for Citizen Kane. He, he wrote something once in, in the title of that entry was what's your favorite movie. And this is what his opening line was for that. It was all movie critics are asked two inevitable questions. One, how many movies do you see in a week? And two, What's the greatest film of all time? Jesus Siskel found that it didn't matter what his reply was to number one, because I can say a dozen. It doesn't really matter. The real answer is between four to ten, but they don't really care. The answer to <laughs> and the answer to two, as we all know, is Citizen Kane. So he is a big champion of that. Now, he, he wrote a 50th anniversary uh, article for it in 91, and then he rewrote another one in 98. He also has uh, audio commentary that if you guys want to, it's on YouTube. Ooh. That if you want to listen to uh, while you're watching the movie, you can as well. But this is the last one he did on May 24th, 98. And let me read this a uh, couple uh, passages here. I don't think any word can explain a man's life, says one of the searchers through the warehouse of treasures left behind by Charles Foster Kane. Then we get the famous series of shots leading to a close up of the word Rosebud on a sled that has been tossed into a furnace. It's paint curling into flames. Remember that this was Kane's childhood sled taken from him as he was torn from his family and sent east to boarding school. Rosebud is the emblem of the security, hope, and innocence of childhood, which a man can spend his life seeking to regain. It is the green light at the end of Gatsby's Pier, the mm-hmm. leopard atop Kilo, Kilimanjaro, seeking nobody knows that. Uh, seeking nobody knows that. The bone tossed into the air in 2001 Space Odyssey. It is the yearning after transience that adults learn to suppress. Maybe Rosebud was something he couldn't get or something he lost, says Thompson, the reporter assigned to the puzzle of Kane's dying word. Anyway, it wouldn't have explained anything. True, it explains nothing. But it is remarkably satisfactory as a demonstration that nothing can be explained. Citizen Kane likes playful paradoxes like that. Its surface is as much fun as any movie ever made. Its steps surpass understanding. I have analyzed it a shot at a time with more than 30 groups. And together we have seen, I believe, pretty much everything that there is on the screen. The more clearly I can see its physical manifestation, the more I am stirred by its mystery. Citizen Kane knows the sled is not the answer. It explains that Rosebud is, but not what Rosebud means. The film's construction shows how our lives, after we are gone, survive only in the memories of others. And those memories butt up against the walls we erect and the roles we play. There's the Kane who made shadow figures with his fingers and the Kane who hated the traction trust. The Kane who chose his mistress over his marriage and political career. The Kane who entertained millions. The Kane who died alone. There's a master image in Citizen Kane you might easily miss. The tycoon has overextended himself and is losing control of his empire. After he signs the papers of his surrender, he turns and walks into the back of the shot. Deep focus allows Wells to play a trick of perspective. Behind Kane on the wall is a window that seems to be of average size. But as he walks towards it, we see it further away and much higher than we thought. Eventually, we stand beneath its lower sill, shrunken and diminished. Then, as he walks towards us, his stature grows again. A man always seems the same size to himself, because he does not stand where he we stand to look at him. I love Roger Ebert. I do this corner. I don't necessarily always agree with his takes on movies, but this man knows how to write and he writes yeah, very sure. personal. That was powerful. And I, I think when we say what the greatest film is of all time, I have disagreements because, you know, greatest and favorite, what is the fine line between those two mm-hmm. things in your, your brain? My favorite will always be Back to the Future. But I don't have any qualm anyone saying that this is the greatest movie that's ever made because of when it was made, how it was made, the creative freedom that Orson Welles has got. This is a classic of the highest regard. This is a movie that needs to be watched by, if you love movies, if you're studying about movies, if you want to make movies, if you're thinking about anything like that, to me, this is a movie, it's, it's a must watch. Absolutely. 
hundred percent agree. Give me, give me your final thoughts on this movie. What, what, what else do you have for, for me? I mean, that was a very powerful thing what Roger Ebert wrote. And I almost want to go back and watch it again with that in mind, yeah. you know, about like some of the dichotomies that I missed in there, you know, about like the, the emperor who stretches his kingdom too far, you know, kind of thing. But the one thing I disagree about is we never know about Rosebud, about like the true meaning of it. And to me, And remember, this is my first time watching it. And so maybe upon subsequent watches, I might have a different interpretation. Mm -hmm. But my thing for the reason he said Rosebud on his deathbed is because at the end of everything, despite all the money and all the possessions, the only thing he could never buy was just the pure happiness of riding his sled down a sleigh. Sometimes it's the simple things in life that money can't buy that are the greatest things in life. Because at the very end of the film, it has this long shot that seems to go on for ages, but probably is only like 30 seconds, you know, of just the camera panning over crates upon boxes, upon piles of treasures he's accumulated over his lifetime from different countries throughout the world of all the different awards. You know, one thing I did like was um, at one point in the film, when he's coming back from Europe, I think it is like his, his staff of the inquirer present him with like this big, like Stanley cup size thing yeah. of like, welcome back. we we missed you kind of thing, you know, from 127 employees <laughs> of the inquirer, we want to say, welcome back. And then like, he like, is like, I'm getting married. Sorry guys. And then he's at the door. But then later on, as the people are going through his possessions, they find that. And they're like, what's this garbage? And they just throw it, you know, but it kind of shows that like, out of all the possessions that he had, the priceless antiques and art pieces that he collected in his very eclectic, um, you know, gallery, the one thing he thought about was this cheap little wooden sled because that was the last time he had truly any free agency over his life where he was the one deciding how long is he going to sled. And I think he really wanted he was really thinking about Rosebud about like, what's the moment in my life where everything changed, where everything turned and what's the moment? What was I truly happy? And it was at that moment. All right, guys, you know, that is citizen Kane. Like I said, this is, this is a classic of to me, the highest order. It is essential viewing for everyone. Uh, let us know what you think of the movie. If you haven't seen the movie and you're anywhere past college, let us know why, you know, I, I get it. Like classic movies are something, you know, we have so much entertainment these days that, mm-hmm. that revisiting a movie that came out almost 40 or not 40, almost 80 years ago. Yeah. It, 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 it I get it. it. It is something that's different, but uh, let me know. This is why we can, I, I decided to do special side episodes of this because I think these will be pretty fun to do showing people that have not seen classics before what they might be missing or, you know, I'm going to hit one of these days where I'm going to show someone a classic and they're just going to be like, I didn't need to watch it, you know, but this movie ain't it. This one ain't it again. Thank you, Greg. I I appreciate you being. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thank you for giving me the reason to watch this. Greg, tell them outside of taking care of your cute son. Thank you. Where can they find you? Um, Yeah. So we're in a bit of a hiatus right now, but we do plan to come back to movie date night. That's at movie date night on Facebook and Twitter. That's where Lord and I share movies back and forth that the other one hasn't seen. So kind of like this podcast, but we don't limit ourselves to just classics. We're mostly focusing more on like modern day stuff, you know. Um, we also have Friday's Game Night, which we're kind of uh, a little bit active with on TikTok right now. Lauren's experimenting with that. Um, right now we're doing this fun thing where we're doing the uh, envelope challenge. You know, yes. you pick an envelope, shows the board game you're going to play and the menu we decide we designed around that. So um, you can find us uh, at Game Friday on Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, all that fun stuff. If you're listening to this, that means you got it from our main channel. Check Film Lovers Guide to the Galaxy. Me, Joe, Jared uh, talk about newer movies, movies that come out, and we get to hear Joe's rants. Uh, until <laughs> I lo- next time. Honestly, I love those. <laughs> yes. He, he, he's the, he's, he's, he is Clint Eastwood at this point. Yeah. <laughs> get off my lawn. But you guys, check out Citizen Kane. Let us know what you think. Until next time, I'll talk to you guys soon.